This is Glenn Lowry of The Glenn Show. I am going to be recording from time to time audio notes, which we will post at The Glenn Show's newsletter. And this is one such. The subject matter, the call of the tribe, the role of identity in our politics and in our lives. This note is in two parts. Here begins part one. We are all familiar with what I'll call the identity reflex. We can all hear the call of some tribe or another. We humans are a variegated lot, differing by race, ethnicity, cultural heritage, religion, and political and sexual orientation. This is, of course, as it should be. Diversity is a good thing. Still, there are times when the call of the tribe just might be a siren's call, and when an excessive focus on identity can lead one badly astray. What is more, I firmly believe that now is just such a time. We are living through what by all accounts has been a most extraordinary period of national reckoning on racial issues, one in which questions of identity have played a huge role. I believe it is important to at least raise, if not always answer, in a gentle and nonpartisan way, the question of what role identity ought to play in our politics and in our lives. Let me get personal. I grew up on the south side of Chicago in the 1950s and 60s. A formative experience for me occurred during one of those earnest political rallies so typical of the period. Witty, who had been my best friend since boyhood, suggested that we attend. The rally had been called by the Black Panther Party and was intended to galvanize our community's response to the killing by the Chicago police of party activist Mark Clark and Fred Hampton during an early morning raid on their apartment in one of the city's many all-black neighborhoods. I can remember even now how agitated about it we all were at the time, and judging by his demeanor, Woody was among the most zealous. Despite this zeal, it took courage for Woody to attend. For although he proclaimed his blackness often, and though he had descended from a Negro grandparent on either side of his family, he nevertheless looked to the entire world like your typical white guy. Everyone on first meeting him assumed as much. I did, too, when we had begun to play together a decade earlier, just after I had moved into the middle-class neighborhood called Park Manor, where Woody's family had been living for some time. There were a number of white families on our block when we first arrived. Within a couple of years, they had all been replaced by aspiring black families like our own. Yet Woody's parents never moved, which puzzled me. Then one day I overheard his mother declare to one of her new neighbors, quoting, we just wouldn't run from our own kind. Somewhat later, while watching the film Imitation of Life on TV, my mother explained how someone could be black even though they looked white. She told me about people like that in our own family, second cousins who lived in a fashionable suburb and on whom one would never dare drop in unannounced because they were passing for white. This was my earliest glimpse of the truth that racial identity in America is inherently a social and cultural, not simply a biological construct, that it necessarily involves an irreducible element of choice. Evidently, Witty's family had also been passing for white in pre-integration Park Manor. Their neighborhood's changing racial composition had forced them to choose between staying and raising their children amongst their own kind or fleeing with the other whites. This was a fateful decision for Witty, who, as he matured, became determined not simply to live among blacks, but perhaps in atonement for his parents' sins, unambiguously to become one. The boys in the neighborhood didn't make that easy. Many delighted in teasing him about being a white boy, and most simply 
refused to credit his insistent, often repeated claim, I'm a brother too. The fact that some of his relatives were passing made Woody's racial identity claims all the more urgent for him, but less compelling to others. He desperately wanted to be black, but his peers in the neighborhood wouldn't let him because he had the option to be white, an option he radically rejected at the time. Those without the option could not accept his claim to a shared racial experience. Now, I knew Witty well, and I wanted to accept him on his own terms, but even I found myself sometimes doubting that he fully grasped the pain, frustration, anger, and self-doubt many of us felt upon encountering the intractability of American racism. However much he might sympathize with our plight, he seemed to experience it only vicariously. So there we were at this boisterous, angry political rally. A critical moment came when Witty, seized by some idea, enthusiastically raised his voice above the murmur to be heard. He was cut short in mid-sentence by one of those dashiki-clad brothers in charge who demanded to know how a white boy got the authority to have an opinion on what black people should be doing. A silence fell over the room. Who can vouch for this white boy? asked the brother, indignantly. More excruciating silence. Now was my time to act. Witty turned plaintively toward me, but I would not meet his eyes. To my eternal shame, I failed to speak up for my friend, and he was forced to leave the meeting without a word having been uttered in his defense. That was not exactly a profile in courage on my part, I have to confess. Our friendship limped along for years, and then I moved away from Chicago and we pretty much lost touch. We never really discussed the incident. Much later, I learned that he had been sympathetic to my plight. He fully understood that forced to choose, as he put it, between my friend and my people, I would have to choose my people. He only wished that I had made him aware of how anguished I was about the whole thing. I never did. And now he's gone, passed away a few years ago. End of part one.